Once upon a time, there was a very rich businessman who had three daughters. Being a man of sense, he spared no cost for his children and their education. His daughters grew to be very beautiful, especially the youngest one, and he named her Beauty, a special name that made her sisters very jealous of her. The two older sisters had a great deal of pride because they were rich. They gave themselves ridiculous hairs and spent a lot of money on it, and would not visit other merchants' daughters nor keep company with anybody but persons of quality. They went out every day to parties, balls, dances, plays, concerts, and everything you can think of, and they would laugh at their younger sister because she spent the greatest part of her time every day in reading good books. Beauty had another name, and it was Belle. Suddenly, all at once, the merchant lost his whole fortune, accepting a small country house at a great distance from town, and told his children with tears in his eyes that they must go there and work for their living, and that times were tough now. The older sisters answered that they would never have to leave the town, for they had several prominent merchants who they were sure. Would be glad to have them, though they had no fortune. But the good ladies were mistaken, for their lovers slighted and forsook them in their poverty, as they were not liked on account of their pride. Everybody said they do not deserve to be pitied. We are very glad to see their pride humbled. Let them go and give themselves quality air in milking the cows and minding their dairy. But added, we are extremely concerned for Beauty. She is such a nice girl, and she's so kind to poor people and has such a friendly, gracious nature. Just a wonderful person, that was. When they came to their country house, the father applied himself to farming, and Belle rose at four in the morning. Before the others stirred. She made haste to clean the house and prepare breakfast for the family. In the beginning, she found it very difficult, for she had not been used to work as a servant. But in less than two months, she grew stronger and healthier than ever. After she had done her work, she would read, she would play on her instruments, or she would sing. On the contrary, her two sisters did not know how to spend their time. They got up at ten in the morning and did nothing. But just lie around the whole day, lamenting the loss of their fine clothes and acquaintance. Do but see our youngest sister," they snickered one to another. "How well she's suited to a life of labor." The family had lived about a year in the country house when the merchant received a letter with an account that a ship he had lost at sea was finally found. The ship held on board dozens of boats. That he had purchased previously, and in fact, it has finally safely arrived. The whole family rejoiced in the turn of their fortune. When the two eldest daughters saw their father ready to set out, one begged him to buy her a new necklace of gems, and the other a thick golden chain with diamonds. When he asked Belle, "What do you want?" the beauty simply. Answered, I just want a rose, Dad. The father set off on his journey, but when he came there, oh, such problems there were over who properly owned the ship and the merchandise on board. And after a great deal of trouble and pains to no purpose, he came back as poor as before. Especially after he bought the fine new necklace and gold chain he promised to his two older daughters, thinking he might come upon a rose bush. To satisfy the wish of his youngest daughter, Belle, he led his horse deep into the woods. As the sun set and the wind began to howl, the poor man realized he was hopelessly lost. What's more, with the rain and the snow, he knew he might well starve to death with cold or hunger, or be devoured by the wolves, whom he heard howling all around him in the woods. Then, in an instant, looking through a long walk of trees, he saw a light from some distance. Going a little closer, he noticed it came from a place lit with candles, from top to bottom. 
The father hastened to the place, but was greatly surprised at not meeting anyone in the outer courts. His horse followed him, and seeing a large stable open, he went in. Finding both hay and oats, the poor beast, who was almost famished, fell to eating very heartily. The father tied him up to the manger and walked towards the house, where he saw no one still. Then he entered into a large hall. He found a good fireplace and a table plenty of food set out. He was quite wet because of the rain and snow. He went close to the fireplace to dry himself up. I hope, he said, the master of this house or his servants will excuse of my just coming in like this. I suppose it's not going to be too long before some of them return. But he was far too hungry, and he couldn't take it any longer. So he took a piece of fried chicken and ate it in two mouthfuls. Trembling all the while, after this he drank a few glasses of wine. Growing more courageous, he went out to the hall and crossed through several grand apartments with magnificent furniture until he came into a chamber. In this room was an exceedingly good bed, and as he was very tired and it was past midnight, he thought it was best to shut the door and just get some rest. By ten o'clock the next morning, the merchant had wakened. As he was going to get up, he was astonished to see a good suit of clothes laid out on the bed that would fit him perfectly. Certainly, he said, this place belongs to some kind fairy who has seen and pitied what I'm going through. He then turned to the great hall where he had supper the night before and found some chocolates ready. To be eaten, they were just lying on a little table. Thank you, good madam fairy, he said out loud, for being so careful as to provide me a breakfast. I'm extremely obliged to you for all your favors. The good man drank his chocolate and then went to look for his horse. But passing through an arbor of roses, he remembered Beauty's request to him, his youngest daughter, and he gathered a branch on which were several. Immediately he heard a great crash like thunder, and looking around he saw a huge monster, two tusks in its mouth and very red eyes, surrounded by bristles and horns coming out of its head, spreading over its back. Please sir, said the merchant in fear and terror for his life, I promised my youngest daughter to bring her home a rose, and I forgot about it till now, and then I saw your beautiful garden and thought that maybe you wouldn't mind giving me a rose? I'm so sorry I should have asked for your permission. Stealing is stealing, said the beast. Whether it's a rose or diamond, your life is forfeit. The merchant fell on his knees and begged for his life for the sake of his three daughters who had nothing but him to rely on. My lord, cried the merchant, I beg you to forgive me. I had no intentions to offend in just getting a rose for one of my daughters. She just really wanted a rose. You say you have daughters? Replied the monster. I will forgive you on one condition. That one of your daughters come willingly and suffer for you. Swear that if any of your daughters refuses to die instead of you, you will return within three months and I will kill you. So the merchant swore he swore to God, one of his daughters would return to accompany the beast. Taking the rose, he got on his rose, horse, and he rode home. As soon as he got into his house, his daughters came rushing around him, clapping their hands and showing their joy in every way. He gave the necklace to his oldest daughter and the gold chain with diamonds to his second daughter. Then finally he gave the rose to his youngest daughter, Belle. Thank you, father, they all cried. But Beauty said, Why are you in such a bad mood when you were giving me my rose? I will talk to you about it later, said the merchant. 
For several days they live happily together, although the merchant wondered about gloomy and sad, and nothing his daughters could do would cheer him up. <laughs> Finally, Belle couldn't take it anymore, and she questioned him. Then he told her what happened. Belle spoke. Since the beast will accept one of your daughters, I will go. I will go for you, father. And I'm very happy in thinking that my death will save my dad's life and be a proof of my tender love for you. Bell, I'm charmed with your kind and generous offer," said the father. "But I can't let you do it. I'm old. I don't have that much long to live. Maybe I'll only lose a few years at the most." Well, that is true, Dad," said Beauty. "You can't go to that place without me, and you can't stop me from following you." Beauty insisted on setting out for the palace, and made the necessary preparations for herself. And her sisters were secretly delighted at the prospect of getting rid of her once and for all. The next day, the merchant took Beauty behind him on his horse, as was the custom in those days, and rode off to the dwelling of the beast. When he got there, they got off on his horse, and the doors of the house opened. And what do you think they saw there? Nothing. There they saw a table spread with all manner of beautiful glass and plates and dishes and napery, with plenty of food to eat. So they waited and they waited, thinking that the owner of the house would appear. Till at last the merchant said, "Let's sit down and see what happens then." When they sat down, invisible hands passed them things to eat and drink, and they ate and drank to their heart's desire. And when they arose from the table, it arose too, and disappeared through the door as if it was being carried by invisible servants. Suddenly, the beast filled the doorway. Is this your younger, youngest daughter? And when he had said that it was, the beast said, "Is she willing to stay here with me?" Then he looked at Beauty, who said in a trem trembling voice, "Yes, sir." Well, no harm shall befall you. With that, he led the merchant down to his horse and said to him, "Honest man, go your way tomorrow morning, but never think of coming here ever again." Then the beast returned to Bell and said to her, "This house, with all that is in here, is yours. If you want anything, clap your hands and say the word." And it shall be brought to you. And with that, he left. So Belle lived on in the home of the beast and was waited by invisible servants and had whatever she wanted to eat and drink. But she soon got tired of the solitude. The next day, when the beast came to her, although he looked really scary, she had been so well treated that she had lost a great deal of. Her terror of him. So they spoke together about the garden and the house and her father's business and all manner of things, so that Beauty lost altogether her fear for the beast. She was no longer afraid of him. Beauty said, "The beast, if my presence is troublesome, I will end our conversation and leave you. For tell me, do you not think I'm very ugly? Well, it's true." Said Beauty, "I can't tell a lie, but I think you have a nice heart." Among mankind, says Beauty, there are many that deserve that name more than you, and I prefer you, just as you are, to those who, under a human form, they have ugly personalities. Beauty ate a hearty supper and had almost conquered her dread of the monster. But she nearly fainted away when he said to her, "Beauty, will you be my wife?" It was some time before she dared answer, for she was afraid of making him angry if she refused. At last, however, she said trembling, "No, beast!" Immediately, the poor monster sighed, and then he hissed so frightfully that the whole palace echoed. But Beauty soon recovered from her fright, for Beast said in a mournful voice, "Then farewell, Beauty," and he left the room. Beauty spent the next three months very contentedly in the 
his palace. Seeing the beast often has so accustomed her to his deformity that, far from dreading the time of his visit, she would often look on her watch to see when it would be nine o'clock, for the beast never missed coming at that exact time. There was only one thing that gave Beauty any concern, which was that very night, every night, before she went to bed, the monster always asked her if she would be his wife. One day she said to him, "Beast, you're making me very uncomfortable. I wish I could consent to marry you, but I'm too sincere to make you believe that will ever happen. I shall always be your friend. Please try to be satisfied with that." I suppose I have to," said the beast. For last, I know too well my own misfortune. Though I ought to think myself happy that you will stay here, promise you will never leave me. Beauty blushed at these words. I could, answered she, indeed promise to never leave you, but I have so great a desire to see my dad that I'm afraid I shall fret to death if you refuse me that satisfaction. Perhaps this will help," said the beast. Then he handed her a handle looking glass, and in the round mirror was the image of Beauty's father, pinning himself sick for the loss of her. It was a magic mirror. Oh my God! She cried, and all the colors rushed from her face. I would rather die myself," said the monster, "than give you the least uneasiness. I will send you to your father." You may remain with him for one week, but if you do not return before the end of the week, I will die with grief. You have my word," said Beauty. "I promise you, I will come back in a week. You shall be there tomorrow morning," said Beauty. "Take this magic-looking glass with you and this ring. You need only to lay your ring on the mirror before you go to bed. When you have a mind to come back, goodbye, Beauty." Beauty waked the next morning. She found herself at her father's house. She quickly dressed and came to the kitchen, where her father gave a loud shriek and thought he would die with joy to see his dear youngest daughter again. He held her fast locked in his arms over a quarter of an hour. As soon as the first transports were over, the father shared with Beauty the good news: both his sisters were finally married. Beauty sent for her sisters, who hastened thither with their husbands. The oldest had married a gentleman, extremely good-looking indeed, but so fond of his own person that he was so full of himself, and he neglected his wife. The second sister had married a man of wit, but he only made use of it to plague and torment everybody, and most of all, he tormented his sis- her sister. Beauty's sister, sickened with envy, when they saw her dressed like a princess. And more beautiful than ever, nor could all her obliging, affectionate behavior stifle their jealousy, which was ready to burst when she told them how happy she was. They went down into the garden to vent in tears, and said one to another, "In what way is this little creature better than us, and that she's so much happier?" Sister said, "The oldest, a thought strikes my mind. She told us of the promise to stay only for one week." Let us try to keep her. Past that week, perhaps the beast will go get so angry for her breaking her word that she, he will devour her. You're right. Good thinking," answered the other sister. They went back to the house and behaved so affectionately to their younger sister that poor Beauty wept for joy. When the week had ended, they cried and tore their hair. And seemed so sorry to part with her that she promised to stay a week longer. In the meantime, Beauty could not help feeling uneasy that she was likely causing pain for the poor beast, whom she sincerely loved and really wanted to see again. The tenth night she spent at her father's, she had a dream that she was in the garden, and the beast was in the garden, and she was watching him suffer, maybe even dying. All because he was lonely for her. Beauty woke up from her nightmare, sat up straight in bed, and burst into tears. "I'm such a bad person," she said. "I'm so mean to him. He has done nothing but be nice to me. Is it his fault he's so ugly? He's kind and good, and that's more than enough. 
why didn't I marry him? I would be happier with the monster than my sisters are with, with their husbands. <sighs> it is neither wit nor a fine face in a husband that makes a woman happy, but virtue, sweetness, no temper, and thoughtfulness. And peace has all these valuable qualifications. Having said this, Beauty rose up, put her ring on the mirror, and then lay down again. Scarce was she in bed before she fell asleep. When she waked the next morning, she was overjoyed to find herself in the beast palace. She put on one of her favorite dresses and waited for evening with the utmost impatience. At last, the wish for hour came. The clock struck nine. The beast was nowhere to be found. Beauty then feared she had been the cause of his death. She ran crying and wringing her hands all about the palace, like one in despair. After having thought for him everywhere, she remembered her dream, and she went to the garden, where she drowned she saw him. There she found the poor beast stretched out, quite senseless, and as she imagined, almost dead. She threw herself upon him, and finding his heart still beating, she fetched some water from the kennel and poured it on his head. The beast opened his eyes and said to Beauty, You forgot your promise. And I was so afflicted for having lost you that I resolved to starve myself. But since I have the happiness of seeing you once more, I die satisfied. No, dear beast, said Beauty, you can't die. You live to be my husband. From this moment, I give you my hand and swear to be no one but yours. Alas, I thought I had only a friendship for you, but the grief I now feel convinces me that I cannot live without you. No sooner had she said this than the height of the beast split in two, and out came a most handsome young prince. The prince told her that he had been enchanted by a magician and could not recover his nature form, natural form until a maiden would, on her own free will, declared that she loved him. Beauty had broken the spell. Thereupon the prince sent for the merchant and his daughters, and he was married to Beauty, and they all lived happily ever after. The End <laughs>